So today we're moving to Ezra and Nehemiah, which records, uh, hopefully you guys read this because you had a quiz on it this is today, so hopefully this is fresh. It records their return to the land, so this is getting us back. So there's a period that breaks. We're not doing Chronicles in this class, but let me briefly say a word about Chronicles. Chronicles comes after Kings, but Chronicles has a whole different outlook than the book of Kings. So if you were to read the two together, you can see they cover many of the same events, but when they cover the same events, they do so in a different focus. Manasseh in Kings is a really bad guy, but in Chronicles, Manasseh actually repents at the end of his life, and it records that. So when we're talking about the kings being bad, I was focusing on the book of Kings. In Chronicles, the, king, the book actually paints the picture of uh, the kings in a more positive light, and not in the sense of it's changing history, in the sense of it focuses on their positive attributes, because Chronicles was written at the very end of the Old Testament, like late, so that it's reminding readers to keep your hope in the Davidic covenant. Okay, but we're not going to cover that. We're just going to go. In fact, Chronicles would have been written at the same time almost as Ezra and Nehemiah. So Ezra and Nehemiah is going to talk about, uh, you guys read it last night, so let's jump in to Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, let me start by telling you a little story. Uh, my wife and I have been married for, uh, when, uh, oh yeah, 18 years, 19 in January, so we're almost to 19. But we've been married 19 years, and our first, right after we got married, our first visit to her, her dad's house as a married couple. So it's probably, I don't know, a few weeks after we've been married. So we're newlyweds, we go to her dad's house. So I'm at my in-laws, first time as, a, as married. And uh, he gets up and he makes us pancakes, okay? Now, he serves me first the pancakes. And he tells me to go ahead and eat because it was kind of like he was serving them hot right off the griddle and he wanted them to eat. So I bite into that pancake and it was the nastiest thing I've ever, ever put in my mouth. I mean, it was, it was awful, almost like oh, gag rufus. But I was like, you know what I said? I said, this is my father-in-law and I'm new. And so I'm not going to insult him and spit out his pancakes. So I slowly work my way through each bite in great pain and agony. Well, so in the meantime, as I'm biting the, uh, pa- eating those nasty pancakes, my uh, wife gets her pancakes. Now, this is his daughter, right? So she's going to be a lot more honest. So she bites into her pancake and immediately goes, oh, dad, these things are nasty. These are the worst pancakes ever. And so he uh, begins to investigate and it comes in here to find out what happened. What happened was, is that instead of putting uh, baking powder in the pancakes, you know where I'm going, he put baking soda in the pancakes. So these things were were, were pretty awful. So why do I tell that story? Well, my father-in-law had put the wrong ingredient in. And that's one way to mess up a dish. Another way to mess up a dish is to be missing an ingredient, right? And so oftentimes, if you, my kids will try to make cookies, and they'll leave out one ingredient, and the cookies are a disaster. Why? Because if you miss one key ingredient, it ruins your recipe. So as I set up Ezra and Nehemiah, here's what I want to say. Ezra and Nehemiah, when you look at the book, it seems like a really positive book because they're coming back to the land, right? Remember? God's place. So he's bringing them back to their land. So it seems like a really important book, I mean, a really positive book. But I want us to keep in mind what we know so far as far as, like, if we think about God's restoration of Israel and his people, what are the ingredients that we already know about? You guys help me. What are the ingredients, so to speak, of God's restoration of his people that you've learned so far in the biblical story? So temple. So what about temple? Restored. Yeah, okay, good. Restored temple. What else is another kind of aspect of God's restoration we talked about? Think about Deuteronomy. What was Israel's hope coming out of Deuteronomy? Circumcised hearts, so heart change. And there's one more really big one, really, really monster one. It was a covenant we just talked about. Davidic covenant, what's the Davidic covenant promise? Anybody? King, king, yes. So here we go. So the ingredients are king, heart change, return to land, and then we can even talk about return to temple. Everybody got that? So keep those ingredients in mind. And as we walk through the book, at the end of the book, I want you to tell me if there's any missing ingredients in the book for the recipe of restoration, okay? So let's walk through Ezra and Nehemiah. So here's how I'm going to do this. This is going to be really easy. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, again, are one book in the Hebrew Bible. That's why I have it hyphenated Ezra-Nehemiah. I think Bible Project might have said that too. Yeah. Okay, good. And so here's how I want to present this material. I'm going to give you three R's. If you can memorize these three R's, you will summarize the, books of Ezra, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. It's that simple. Okay, you guys know the first R. Help me out. What's the first R? It's actually on the screen. Return. Yes, thank you. Good, you got it. Return. 
Now, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, there are actually three returns. So three different kind of trips from Babylon to the land. The first one is by a guy, y'all remember his name? Weird name. It's a Z name. Uh, Zerubbabel. Y'all remember Zerubbabel? Okay. Well, it's kickstarted by a Persian king named, anybody know his name? He made an edict. Yes, Cyrus. The Edict of Cyrus. This is your last date, by the way, that you need to know. You need to know the Edict of Cyrus is in 538 B.C. So Cyrus is a Persian king uh, who makes this edict. Would anybody like to uh, read a passage? Read Ezra 1, 2 through 4. Uh, and as he's looking that up, let me just say this. So Cyrus, so by this time, remember, in kings we leave, and Babylon is the dominant power in the ancient Near East. So you had Assyria, then you had Babylon, and now the dominant power in the ancient Near East is Persia. So when the Persians take over, uh, Cyrus comes along and makes an edict, and that sets up the return of Zerubbabel and those with him, okay? So pretty impressive edict. He's basically saying, if you want to go back to Jerusalem, go back and then let people give you stuff to rebuild the temple that's in Jerusalem. So this is like, we might call this a majorly generous uh, dealing with Judah, the, the Judahites who went to Babylon, as compared to like the Assyrian and the Babylonian kings, Okay. And what's interesting in verse 1, it says that uh, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. So we see God's hand working in this. And we'll talk about that in just a second. All right, so that's the first one, Edith of Cyrus. The second return is by who? who? Who is the main guy in the second group of returnees? So the second group is Ezra. Okay? The second group is Ezra. Now, think about this. Ezra, if you look how much time has passed... I'll do the math for you because I know it hurts some of your noggins. Uh, there's 80, year, 80 years between Zerubbabel returning and then when Ezra returns. So keep that in mind. That's a pretty big time gap um, between those returns. And Ezra was a what? Do you remember what Ezra was? He was a scribe, yes. So he would have been an expert in the law of Moses and in interpreting the law. And that's why Ezra comes, and we'll talk about what he does a little later, but when Ezra comes, he's interpreting the law and reading the law to the people. Okay, so that's his... Uh, his thing. And then the last return is who? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. There we go. So Nehemiah comes in 445 BC. So you can see that the time difference between uh, Ezra and Nehemiah is only 13 years. In fact, they overlap a good bit in the book. Everybody got that? So just keep this in mind because it's gonna, this, especially this 13 year little uh, layer is going to become important in a, in a little while. All right, let's talk about this. Let me show you real quick. Here's the timeline. It's over. So how many dates I give you? One, two, three, four, five, six dates. There you go. So that's not bad. Um, we got there. So you got Abraham, Exodus, divided kingdom, exile of Israel, exile of Judah, and then Edict of Cyrus. Let's talk real quick about a major theme that comes out of these three returns. And here's the key theme. You can see it here. God's sovereignty over foreign rulers. Okay, God's sovereignty over foreign rulers. By sovereignty, what do we mean when we say God's sovereignty? Anybody? It's a really important doctrine that we've talked about before with Joseph. Y'all remember Joseph talked about God's sovereignty? What, is so what do we mean by God's sovereignty? It's God's control, God's rule, and reign over the events of life. Okay? Uh, so God, as the Lord of the universe, directs human history and human affairs to his intended purposes. And what's interesting is, is every one of these returns shows us how God is working through the foreign rulers on behalf of his people. So let, right here, so Ezra 1, 1, I just told you this. It says, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Then with Ezra, it says, this is Ezra's words, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king. And then Nehemiah says, and the king granted me what I asked. Why? For the good hand of my God was upon me. In other words, every time it was acknowledged that the reason these kings were acting in good favor or goodness towards Judah, the remaining people from Judah, was because God was working in the heart of the king. God was giving them favor in the eyes of the king. Now, why might this be a very important theme for those Israelites who were living under Persian rule. Okay, so one, it gives them hope, right, that, that this is temporary because God's made promises for a greater thing than being under Persian rule. 
But just think about it, they're, they're under the control of a foreign nation, the Persian Empire. And it's a great reminder that even though it looks like the Persian Empire is in control of them, that ultimately the one controlling the ruler of the Persian Empire is none other than Yahweh. He, he is the, that's why the Bible calls him the King of Kings. He literally rules over kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He rules over the Lords. And especially in the ancient world empire, uh, these kings were like, I mean, like demigods. They were, they were looked up to. They were well, well honored and held in high esteem. And so uh, I love Proverbs 21. 1. It says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of Yahweh. He turns it wherever he will. So let me just say this. There's a lesson here for us, too. Um, especially this season in our, in our, uh, in, in our this is election, election year, so this is always very important, is that this, is that as Christians, we all have our favorite candidates probably, maybe, um, and as Christians, we don't have to be panic-stricken and live in fear if who we wanted to get in office didn't get in office. And I'm not talking about just in the presidential, I'm talking about that all the way down to governors and state and local officials. It doesn't matter who's in control because we know who is ultimately in control. Right? Now, that's not to say we shouldn't care. The point is, is that as Christians, we don't have to be panic-stricken and we don't have to be live in fear because we know the president of presidents, to put that in perspective for you. We know the one who rules over all rulers and who rules over all the world. And that's a comfort for us, um, that as Christians, we know this one who is sovereign over all rulers. Um, whether they're good rulers or whether they're bad rulers, he's still working his purposes for his glory and his honor in the world. Let's talk about another, another R. It's rebuild. Again, now let me uh, set this up because under this point, uh, we're going to look at two things they rebuild, which you guys probably know really easily off the top. But what I want to show you is, is here is, uh, is how the author actually uses the rebuilding to kind of um, soften the positivity of the book. Let me, let me give you a straight. So when I was a kid, I grew up three hours from the beach, uh, from the ocean. So we lived, I lived in central Alabama, so we were three hours from Gulf Shores. And so when we go down to the beach, especially as young kids, uh, if you guys have been to the beach with your parents, you know this, what do they warn you about when you go out into the waves? Yes, the undertow. I'm in the Midwest. I can, okay. Yes, if you go to the beach, they warn you about the undertow. Um, we have family in Miami, and we go to Miami. The rip tides are big down there, but undertow. And so what that is is if you, you've ever if you've ever been to the beach, you know you can go get in the waves, right? And the waves are pounding you up here in the chest. But when the waves pass, there's always something under you pulling your feet out. And when there's a strong undertow, especially as a kid, you can actually get sucked out into the ocean and drown because the undertow. So you can't see it, right? On the surface, the waves look like they're coming in, but an undertow is basically the water going back out, and it pulls under the waves and pulls you out. And the reason I tell you that illustration is because I would argue that in, these, in this, this section of the book where there's the rebuilding, there's actually a strong undertow that keeps us pulled away from seeing these events as the ultimate restoration. Everybody got that? Okay, so let's talk about these two. So these are pretty easy. Uh, what's the first important thing they rebuild? Temple. There we go. They rebuilt the uh, temple. And this is recorded in the early chapters of Ezra kick-started by Zerubbabel, but they got a little resistance. Do you remember the resistance they got? And then they uh, actually, two prophets who were in the Bible, Haggai and Zechariah, had to come and prophesy for them to get started again on the project, and they finally finished. Now, here's the deal. On the temple, uh, there's an undertow. And I don't know if you remember this, but if you remember, there's this scene when they laid the foundation of the temple, okay? When they laid the foundation, it says the young people did what? Do you remember this? The young people were like cheering and celebrating because they had laid the foundation of the temple. But the old guys started doing what? Crying, like weeping. And, and again, listen, our culture, we, uh, especially men, we don't know how to cry really well. But in Israel's culture, in that culture, boy, they knew how to cry. Like when they cry, they weep. They let it, they let it, they let it go. And so here's what it said. It said that, they, that people around them couldn't distinguish the sounds of the weeping from the sounds of rejoicing. It was kind of like chaos. Now, here's my question. Why did the old guys cry? The, the old guys would have seen whose temple? Solomon's temple. Y'all remember how, gr how glorious that temple was? It was a beautiful temple. And they look at this temple and they're like, just start bawling. They can't hold, they can't hold it. It's like, it's like kind of a, 
having like a really nice car, right? And then you, something happened to your car, and instead of your car, you get like one of those little model cars. I mean, that's kind of what it is. It's like they get the 32 to 1 size uh, of the temple. It's just really small, and they're like really disappointed. And so they start weeping. So again, there's the undertow. They have a temple, but it's like a micro temple compared to their Solomonic temple. So there's, they're there, but their glory's not there, right? Is the other, is kind of the undertow in the book. All right. The second thing they rebuild is what? The city wall. And again, uh, maybe, again here, uh, this was led by, you remember this? Nehemiah, right? He leads the city wall rebuilding. And even here they also have resistance because, remember at one point they had to stand there and they had to fight. They had to have a sword in one hand and basically the tool to build the wall in the other hand. They were, that's how they were getting resistance. And this is actually when they, they officially broke away from the Samaritans because the Samaritans came and wanted to help them and Nehemiah's like, no, no thank you. Um, now, here, here's the deal on both of this one. On the city wall, what's the undertow? So the wall's good, right? Remember what I said about walls. If you didn't have a wall in the ancient world, you were basically a sitting duck because they were going to come and they were going to attack you because you had no defenses. So they build the wall, okay? And when they build the wall, uh, do you remember anything negative about it? Let me read you a verse, okay? So here, here's where we go. It says in chapter, this is Nehemiah 7, 4. It says, the city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. So you get that? They had this big city. So they built, rebuilt the walls. They had this big city, but they don't even have enough people uh, to fill the city or the houses in the city. So it's kind of like, we got our city back, but we're kind of few in number. So again, is it positive? Yes, it's positive. They rebuilt the wall. But where's the negative? The negative is, is they don't even have enough people in the city to fill the city. Okay, so just another reminder that it's not this glorious age like they experienced with Solomon, where, you know, silver was as equal to a stone. It was that, there was that much wealth. The third R is reform. So if you remember Ezra, he had to come in and he had to reform intermarriage. Do y'all remember this? Now remember, and even though they had to come reform, remember Ezra and Nehemiah were very faithful to Yahweh. So they're the good guys. So when Ezra gets there, if you remember, what, what, is, what, what does he see? What is the intermarriage thing here? You remember? Who do they intermarry? With the Babylonians. Yeah, they intermarry with the, with the women in the land, right? They started intermarrying with foreign women in the land. Now, again, uh, let's talk about this. Why is that bad? They adopt their idolatry, okay? He basically rebukes them and forbids them to intermarry the foreign women. Now, I do want to take a moment real quick, and um, actually the book of Ezra ends with a list of people, a list of the Levites who actually had, who, who basically participated in this sin. So it'd be kind of, wouldn't it be kind of stinky that your only kind of cameo or appearance in the Bible was in a list of people who'd sinned? Like, hey, I made the Bible, um, but I made it, but they're sinning. Uh, here's the deal. I want to talk about this because sometimes I think uh, this passage is erroneously used in application to interracial marriage. Have y'all ever heard of that? Maybe. Some of you, some, I, I see some nods. Some of you might have heard this. Um, okay, so here's the, let me just state my thesis and you guys tell me if you agree, if, why. So I, I would argue this passage has nothing to do with interracial marriage. This has a much different application. Why? The application of this passage for us is not marrying someone with a different belief system. Yes, in Corinthians where Paul tells believers not to be unequally yoked which has, in the context of Paul's discussion, an application to marriage, but it actually has more than, more than marriage in view. Um, a yoke would be something where two people are like, tied together, committed, so you can even pursue that to like, business partnerships and stuff like that. Because Paul's point is, what does light have to do with darkness? Okay. So I think what is clear in the New Testament and the clear application from this passage, the motive for this wasn't that God's racist and doesn't want them to intermarry Moabites or Ammonites, who were their, kind of their cousins, what God is after is he doesn't want the foreigners to turn their hearts to their God. So it has a religious function. So that fits perfectly with Paul's prohibition in the New Testament that a believer, if you're a Christian, you should not marry a non-believer. Okay, that's the prohibition. Uh, that's where this works itself out. Um, so because you're operating from different uh, worldviews, and as a Christian, God's again zealous for your affections, and if you marry an unbeliever, the chances are you will be pulled away into the darkness um, that, like Paul mentions there in 1 Corinthians 6. So let me just say categorically 
that the, I, don't, I can't find anywhere in the Bible that interracial marriage would, would be prohibited at all. And in fact, if it's a two believers, I don't care what color they are, they should get married, right? Um, and I'll just tell you guys, especially in our culture today, if you find someone who's faithfully walking with the Lord, um, then you should, you should hang on tight and grab hold because that's rare today to find somebody who's actually walking in faithfulness to God and His commands. Here's what's interesting. 13 years later, 13 years later, Nehemiah steps on the scene, okay? And Nehemiah also has to do some reforms in the land, okay? Nehemiah also has to reform the people. Now, I don't want to, um, gosh, man, we could go a lot, but uh, Nehemiah has to do a lot of stuff. I'm just going to, he kind of, the author kind of saves it to chapter 13. So let me just tell you one. The first thing Nehemiah does is he has to reform several other sins. So let me just give you a laundry list real quick. Uh, you can read these in Nehemiah chapter 13. First of all, there was this room that they had prepared for one of Nehemiah's enemies who was not a priest in the temple. So he rebukes them for this room they prepared for one of his enemies in the temple. Okay. So again, the only people in the temple were supposed to be the priest. And here they had prepared it for an outsider. Also, they began, uh, if you remember, you probably don't remember this, but in the laws, the people were supposed to take a portion of their sacrifices and give them to the Levites for, for their food, and they weren't doing that. They quit giving the Levites their portion, so they were violating the law in that way. Another thing they did wrong is they were breaking the Sabbath. So merchants were coming in the city, and they were selling on the Sabbath, so Nehemiah gets angry about that, and he actually, he actually shuts the gates on the Sabbath so they can't break the Sabbath. So... There's several things they're doing wrong that are breaking specific laws that were given to Israel in the Old Covenant. But the kicker is, is guess what other sin Nehemiah had to rebuke? Take a wild guess. Yeah, they intermarriage again. So 13 years after Ezra had rebuked them, Nehemiah comes along and has to rebuke them for the same thing. Now let me just say this, um, Nehemiah... It's, I like his style a little better than Ezra. So when Ezra found out that the people had committed intermarriage, he basically started pulling his own hair and getting angry and hitting himself. Nehemiah had a much better strategy. Nehemiah, when he saw the intermarriage, guess whose hair he pulled out? He pulled out their hair and he started hitting them. So Nehemiah is much better. I mean, why punish yourself for somebody else's sins? He just took it out on them, right? And so Nehemiah reforms them again uh, the second time. Now, Here's my question on this. So really, that's, that's where we're at in Ezra and Nehemiah. But my question is, let's go back to the open illustration. The people are back in the land. And it looks like God's beginning His restoration process here with this, these returns and this rebuilding of the temple. But we have, uh, so it is positive, but we have some key, big, missing ingredients. And what are our missing ingredients in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that serve as like a bridle to keep us from reading this as the ultimate restoration that God had promised his people. Okay, one, the biggest, this is the most important. Next week we'll talk about this in the prophets. The biggest uh, kind of hole or the biggest missing ingredient is the fact that Israel is still under Persian rule. They are not independent and they don't have a king. And what we'll see next week in the prophecies is that her king was actually prophesied not just to rule over Israel, but to rule over all the nations. So it's a little inverted here. They're being ruled over by a powerful nation instead of their king ruling over all the nations. So the big thing that's missing is there's no king. What else is missing? Yes, the hearts. The heart is, they still have heart. Now, now listen, the exile cured them of what sin that we saw a ton of in the, in the Old Testament so far? Idolatry. Right? You notice in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, we don't see idolatry. Everybody got that part. But what we see is, is they're still breaking the covenant in many other ways, especially with Nehemiah. Like all three of those things that I read off to you were clear violations of what God had told them, the laws he had given them on Mount Sinai. So the people still have a heart problem in the sense is they're not living in obedience to Yahweh. Okay? So they haven't had their hearts circumcised. They haven't had their hearts changed, and they're still living in that. Now, there's one more that we didn't talk about at the beginning. So if we go back and you read in Exodus when they built the tabernacle, and if you go back and read in Kings when they built the temple, in both cases, when they finished building the tabernacle and the temple, the glory of God showed up in a major way. 
It, it was like it said a cloud came and filled them so that even Moses in Exodus and the priest in Kings could not walk into the temple. So that's, that's like amazing. Like God's glory shows up in such a magnificent way that it basically blows everybody away so they can't enter the temple. In, in Ezra, when they finish the temple, what happens? Nothing. There is no glory cloud that comes down and descends the temple. So what seems to be missing here is kind of the key to Israel being blessed, and that is God's presence. God's glory doesn't show up. The text doesn't make a big deal about that, but we should make a big deal about it because it's a glaring contrast to the other temple types. So we're still waiting for God's glory, still waiting for God's king, and we're still waiting for heart change. And in just about a week, we're going to see those all come